Right. So, um, you know, Dr. Is it Pieja? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Pieja, um, you know, made contact and uh, told me about all the good work you are doing. Uh, yeah. and, uh, being your birthday this week, uh, <laughs> yeah. I thought it would be a nice way to just have a, you know, a chat and uh, about the good work you are doing uh, as part of your birthday celebrations. You know. Okay. Yeah. No. I was also very excited to hear about your work. Yeah. I wasn't aware. Yeah. Believe me, I'll be your follower from now on because I'm very passionate yeah. about the stuff that this you're area, doing. Especially this area of um, you know non-pharmacological uh, interventions. You exactly. Know? Yeah. So it's yeah. An That's area exactly. that we could make a big difference. Uh, mm. but mm. it's not a sexy area uh, no. from, from a commercial point of view. True. You see? <laughs> so, so, so when you are pushing this direction, you are definitely working against uh, big pharma and other people. Who yeah, are very especially big pharma, sure. Yeah, Those guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, but I want to hear more. Also, the, that, the, um, the work you are doing there at the varsity with um, the machines you got from Germany. That you from are using. Belgium. Belgium, yes, yes, yes. You know, so I'm just interested that also to hear about that. I'm thinking I might also just become a guinea pig and just go and <laughs> check myself. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome there no, anytime. <laughs> uh, if there are no early signs uh, mm. of. Um, <laughs> Uh, target organ damage was I'm actually uh, I've got type 2 diabetes since last oh, year. Oh, sure. You know, uh, hey, that thing is sneaky. Yes, yes, you mm. know. So it's important to actually know now uh, how my, you know, kidneys and other key organs are doing. Organs are functioning, at yeah. At this point, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But otherwise, Prof, so the first part, and we'll spend not so much time, just you know about who prof is you know where you come from yeah. what kind of child you were growing up the kind of things okay. that you wanted to do, yeah. just to get people to to have that background because when one googles your book your biography it's already more about the professional work you're doing yeah and yeah sometimes yeah. one wants to get a sense of of where we are you, you know yeah and i find that part very encouraging to people because they sometimes think maybe you are the lucky one exactly so exactly. whenever i'm giving public addresses i actually tell them that i just grew up in the dusty streets of, of orlando east yeah you know uh, yeah. struggling but, but like 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 any average you know a black exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So okay. Um. So um. We'll start there. Just you okay. know. Um. The kind of family you grew up in. Are you yeah. first born, last born, middle okay. child? Kind of values you got from your family and the community. How were you yeah. at in primary school, high school, and then, you know, how did you choose your 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 your, your tertiary career? You know. Yeah. And how mm. did you land up? Uh, actually, you know, um, in physiology, you know, mm, yeah. that you are now a global expert on, you know, yeah. and then we get to the things you are doing uh, in that space. Okay. okay. Yeah. So okay. That's, that's just that, but it's more of a very light uh, type of conversation. Okay, not detailed physiological <laughs> mechanisms. No, because the, some that's of the not... people who listen are not necessarily, you know, um, scientists. Yes, you know, so we want to okay. make it. No, that, yeah, that helps me a lot, knowing that helps me, because yeah. I must know my audience. Exactly. Sometimes I bore other people by, you know, uh, talking something light instead yeah. of telling them about metabolic processes yes. and no. genetic changes. Yes, so, so we uh, have to talk at a at an accessible level so that more people because the, the you know the focus of your work obviously it's scientific work but it's also to impact the people who have not really been blessed with the knowledge that you have 
you know. Yeah, who, yeah. Who are the ones yeah. who are suffering from uh, these non-communicable diseases. True, yeah. Yeah. All right, Prof. So um, it's actually four o'clock. Uh, okay. So we, we will have the conversation. This is going to be recorded. And I've then, already seen that and accepted. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it will be recorded. Uh, and then we will again play it later on the social media channels. But for oh, now, okay. we, we, we need to record it. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. All okay. Right. Uh, let me see now. I think we will do it like this. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who have joined us uh, on this uh, <coughs> Dr. Fundi channel, um, you know, using various uh, media platforms. Uh, my name is Dr. Fundi Lenyati. Uh, I am a family physician uh, and the host on this channel. Today, um, I have a special guest, and my special guest is Professor Muzi Masteko. Um, he's a very interesting guest. Uh, as you will know, uh, in a few minutes from now, he is, uh, you know, a human physiology expert. He is a cardiovascular research scientist uh, at Vet Medical School. He qualified in Master of Science uh, in Medicine. He also has got a PhD in physiology. Uh, but on top of that, he actually went and studied theology uh, from the Baptist Theology College. So you've got a combination of a scientist, a researcher, uh, a lecturer, um, you know, um, but also somebody who's highly spiritual, you know, uh, who has been to a theology school. So um, we'll get to here about how he manages to balance the two, because at times people think that uh, matters of science, um, you know, cannot be uh, linked with matters uh, of uh, spirituality. So, but he has managed to do that. He is an author uh, of a book that is called Daniel's Fast. All right. Uh, so, uh, just hold on, uh, Tabby, I need to get it to mute, all right. So uh, he's an author of a book called The Daniel's Fast, uh, which is diet based on the principles from the book of Daniel's in the Bible. Um, and in that book, he shares biblical and scientific facts around the concept uh, of diet. Um, a number of uh, people uh, or articles have been published in both uh, lay media and also, you know, scientific media about the work that he does. So um, with that introduction, uh, I introduce you to Professor Muzi Masepo. Prof, welcome to the Dr. Fundi channel. Uh, thank you, Doctor, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, Prof, I, I understand that uh, a few days ago, it was your birthday. Uh, so, you know, I thought that would be a nice way of celebrating your birthday for us to just have a chat uh, about this man, Professor Muzima Seko, uh, the great work that he is doing. Uh, to ensure that uh, the people of this country, the people of this continent, uh, you know, the people of African ancestry have a better understanding of the drivers, uh, you know, of the <coughs> lifestyle illnesses like hypertension, obesity, you know, diabetes, and how through using practical solutions uh, that are not always pharmaceutical, 
uh, they can be able to either prevent them or better manage them. So welcome, Prof. Thank you very much. Right, right, Prof. Um, now, I just, just to kickstart this discussion, Prof, I just want to have a sense, you know, before we talk about Prof and all the good work that Prof is doing, you know, Prof comes from somewhere. Where yeah. were you born? What kind of family were you born in? Uh, what were the influences growing up that have yeah. made us to have this gift uh, of an intellectual uh, that is now helping us to deal with problems that are afflicting South Africa and the world? Yeah, uh, that's one part of my life uh, that I enjoy talking about uh, because it actually uh, shows that even ordinary people, you don't need a special advantage to actually make it in life. When people hear that you are a professor, they may have think you had good parents, you know, you got to the best schools, uh, the best education. Um, oh, oh. My life was actually a life of struggle. Yeah. I was Bye. born in a family of um, five people, uh, mom, dad, um, actually six, mom, dad, and uh, three siblings. I'm a lost, last born. I have, uh, I had four elder sisters, one has since uh, passed away. Mm. Uh, and very on in life, my struggle started when uh, I was 10 months old and my dad passed away. Mm. And unfortunately, he was a teacher, my mom was a domestic worker. Yeah. And unfortunately, did not leave a will. And I would advise yeah. men, please write a will. Yes. <laughs> uh, my mom through was cheated out of everything. Yeah. You know, she lost everything, the house and everything that my dad had. And my mom with uh, four kids was kicked out into the streets. Yeah. And that's when my life uh, started as a struggle then. But even though she was a domestic worker, she would move from one house to another to get accommodation. Yeah. She made sure that, you know, the four of us stayed at school. Mm. Uh, she struggled for that. And fortunately, as my elder sisters finished school metric, uh, they also started working uh, and they helped a, a bit, but I was not also completely dependent. Uh, I sometimes see these people carrying these big boxes with uh, rubble, you know, pushing it next to the street. Yeah. Uh, I used to do that during school holidays. Yeah. And during weekends, go to a damp place in Orlando East. Yeah. We called it Matigituan. Yeah. And uh, get some scrap metals and go and sell for cash yeah. in town just so that I can have something, yeah. you know, for school. And fortunately, I was doing very well. Yeah. So by high school, actually, I got a, a buzzer uh, to take me through high school. There yeah. was an organization at Mzimtlope called the Rent Bazaari Fund that yeah. was run by Dr. Kambule, Professor yeah. Kambule, yeah, one of the yeah. greatest yeah. mathematicians. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, he was once a principal at Orlando High School. Yes, yes. And I think he went on to also start another sort of a private school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, his work is amazing. Yeah. So through that organization, at least I had uh, books, uh, you know, uh, I had pocket money, uniform to usually kids don't need bursaries at high school. Yeah. I mean, my school fees was two rands, but <laughs> my mom couldn't afford that. <laughs> I needed yeah. a bursary for that. Yeah. So life was really tough. I yeah. remember the least favorite, uh, favorite moment in my life was when the bell would ring after school and kids would be excited that they are going home. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was a nightmare because I didn't know where I was going that day. Yeah. I have to go and knock in a relative's door. Sometimes yeah. they open, sometimes they don't. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that was uh, quite a challenge. 
Uh, fortunately, doing well, I managed to get uh, uh, an exemption. In matric. Uh, yeah, in matric and got another bursary. I think it was Equal Opportunities Fund, yes. uh, which was also looking for disadvantaged kids. Yes. And I managed to go to varsity. Uh, and that solved two of my problems. I yes. could advance now academically, and now I had a home. Yes. Wow, my room meant everything to me. <laughs> yes, yes. I drop. All right. Um, I'm not sure what happened there to Prof. We were still, you know, conversing nicely. Uh, him telling us about um the early days uh you know of his life that uh, at the age of 10 months old he lost his dad uh, and because his dad died without him um you know having written a will his mom lost everything that uh, his dad had actually left for them now uh, he was telling us that uh, you know from those early days, life became a challenge for him uh, and his three siblings, uh, older sisters. Um, he used to struggle with his family in terms of accommodation, but because he was a child who was very smart, a child you know, who did well uh, at school, he managed to get you know, uh, bursaries to actually help him through uh you know he remembers uh, you know some of the great teachers uh, that actually instilled you know the love of science and maths uh, in those early days uh, and he actually says through all of that he has been able or he was able to get exemption at high school uh, and because of the good grades in high school he also get you know, he managed to get uh, a bursary for him to go and, uh, you know, do his undergraduate uh, degree uh, at university. Uh, and so uh, for him, uh, you know, the fact that he was a gifted child, he managed to get the bursaries, and now at tertiary, he actually had a, a place to stay in uh, that to him was something that was really, really big. So um, I'm just, you know, checking uh, to see uh, what has since happened to our guest. Um, but I'm sure um, we still have a lot to talk about uh, because we just wanted uh, information about his background uh, as a way of just setting the scene for us to better understand this man who is now a, you know, a world-class scientist, a, a world-class physiologist, uh, somebody who is a patriot, somebody who's a true African, somebody who wants uh, to educate and make opportunities you know, uh, available to others uh, so that uh, the challenges of the diseases that we call non-communicable diseases can actually be uh, better managed. Uh, because as we know, at this moment, most people with hypertension, most people with diabetes mellitus, most people with raised blood cholesterol, you know, um, the interventions are very much uh, interventions uh, that, makes you, that make use uh, of tablets. Yet from the work that he's doing, uh, as a physiologist, a world-class physiologist, he has actually demonstrated, uh, you know, tangible value uh, of use of what we call non-pharmacological interventions, um, you know, in the management of these uh, conditions or diseases. So, um, Prof, I can see him, he's trying to connect again. Um, but, you know, one thing I did not say at the beginning about Prof um, is that he has got this special interest on non-communicable diseases, um, you know, and uh, 
how they affect people of African ancestry. He's also an advocate for non-pharmaceutical -pharma interventions uh, to prevent the onset of these lifestyle diseases, hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, and others. But beyond that, he is also involved in philanthropy work. Um, you know, he spent some time, uh, Prof spent some time um, in Europe, um, you know, as part of, you know, a global group of uh, physiologists who were trying to put their heads together as to what needs to be done uh, to make sure that uh, these conditions uh, of non-communicable uh, diseases can be better managed because they are a problem across the world, not only in South Africa, not only in the continent of Africa, but across the world. But so he spent about seven months in Europe uh, and uh, came back with some very expensive equipment that actually, um, you know, helps him to do great work at Vets University. Uh, and through that work, he has been able to make, you know, access uh, to these expensive type of uh, interventions, um, you know, for people who cannot normally afford these kind of uh, interventions. Uh, in one of the videos that I listened to uh, in preparation for this meeting, he actually mentioned that uh, the cost of doing these assessments is somewhere around two 2,000 rands each. And not many people without medical aid have got access uh, to that type, uh, you know, of expensive investigations. So, Prof, uh, are you back? Hey, Prof. Uh, yes, I'm back. Sorry, load shedding. Oh. Um, uh, we had load shedding this. All right, let's let's see if uh, your connection will be better. Um, Side and I was using my laptop. And the battery went off. <laughs> uh, am I audible? You are audible. Maybe yeah. what, you, what you could do, Prof. Uh, what you could do, uh, Prof. Uh, prof. It's not... uh, you, maybe you can switch off the video and we just do the audio. Prof? Uh... Yes? Yeah, I was saying maybe let's use the yes. audio. Can you... yeah. I can hear you better now. Prof? Prof. Okay, yes, I've switched off. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's let's let's. Uh, Hello. Let's, let's continue just with uh, with with the audio. All right, Prof. All right. Now. Okay. Check All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. You very clearly. All right. Let, let 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 me let me try and uh, just correct one little thing here. Um, you see, technology has got a problem that sometimes things work so well, and all of a sudden, then uh, you've got problems. So let's hope that uh, we'll continue uh, with our interview without uh, much disruption now. All right, can you hear me, Prof? Who? Okay, that is becoming a challenge. Uh, that is becoming a challenge. Uh, in the meantime, whilst Prof is trying to sort himself out, uh, maybe let me ask Dr. Pieja. Uh, let me just ask him to unmute himself. Uh, Dr. Pieja? Yes, yes, Doc. 
All right, I'm going to hijack you uh, for okay. now whilst yes. Rob is trying to get his connectivity right because I'm not sure what is happening. Um, yes. he, he mentions that there was some form of load shedding, uh, okay. yes. which affected his uh, connectivity. So whilst he's yes. trying to sort that out, uh, I'm coming back to you um, yes. as somebody who knows Prof uh, very well. Um, mm -hmm. So I was still trying to get... <coughs> Uh, do, do you want to switch on your camera, pro, uh, Doc? Okay, let me see how do I switch my camera now. Uh, which one? Right, lovely, lovely. That one is okay. Hello? Right. Hey, Prof. Okay, let me get out. Ah, uh, wait, let's, let, let's see if his connection is, is stable before you get out, uh, Doc. Okay. All right. Uh, let me see now. Just, just hold on, Doc. So technology has has got a way of embarrassing one at times, you know. Uh, yeah, no. Because uh, we were going nicely with uh, Prof until uh, something happened, and uh, all of a sudden now we are not able to get things the way uh, we wanted. Just, all right, just 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 hold on. All right, uh, Doctor Doctor Pira. Yes. Right. Um, Whilst we're trying to get Prof to come back, um, yes, you suggested or you recommended that uh, I have a chat with Prof uh, okay. uh, because of the great work that he is doing. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how you know Prof and the work that he does? Oh, yeah. Um, I... Yes, um, I know Prof. Um, I think uh, I should add that I know Prof. First of all, I think uh, we belong to the same Christian faith. Um, we're also activists. We're also activists at the same time. Um, yes. Social issues, but uh, also, yes, yeah, so that's how we came. But then um, it's through that activism. And then also me as a medical doctor, a general practitioner. Mm. Yes. So then we find that we have got a no, similar thing. I'm, I'm, hello? Yes, I'm listening. Yes, so uh, me, myself, as a Cuban graduate, yes. uh, myself, so with a lot of passion in the primary health care. Yes. So that's when we started to interlink. Yes. Um, because I'm passionate about issues of primary health care. And then I found that uh, Prof has got a passion and also expertise in managing, as you've already highlighted, the chronic uh, non-communicable uh, medical conditions, like you mentioned, hy hypertension, diabetes, and all that. Yeah. And I also then came to learn of the good work through the clinic, best uh, yeah. clinic, hypertension clinic. Yes. that uh, he is running for free uh, yes. somewhere in Park Town, where you've already spoken about the machine, whereby it's more of a cardiology a consultation, but more yes. from a physiological point of view, that yes. you will walk in and then they will then assess, uh, that machine assesses, uh, check your heart and it, it checks uh, your cholesterol and from there, the prof interpret. So um, to make it easy, it's like the way we as GP, we will use uh, ECG, for example. Yes. Uh, but prof uses that machine, therefore, when he connects, then he can then, when you get out, he will then tell you, I mean, uh, going from a theoretical, he will talk of the systolic and diastolic uh, functioning of your heart, and what are the chances of you developing hypertension and uh, recommend therefore lifestyle modification that you yeah. can do. Yeah. So 
for, it, it is from that angle that I realized that therefore um, this is a, a, a very affordable way mm. that people can really benefit. Uh, because hey, sorry. Can, uh, can you, yeah? Yeah, so like I said that, and then I realized that uh, from a, a primary health care perspective, we really need um, exposure and uh, education about what Prof is doing, because yeah. I find that it, it, it requires less resources. Um, yes. it is what it is what uh, people in the urban and rural can actually implement, because then uh, he also then um, from the diet there are kind of food that he tells you from a physiological point of view that they can actually manage mm. you to control or minimize the chances of you developing hypertension. Yes. And, 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 and when you check the kind of food, vegetables are the ones that our rural folks can really get access to. Mm. Because it's more of vegetables, and yeah. of course, you know, we will call it a beetroot, for example. Yeah. But yeah. he will then call it with a scientific name and tell you its properties. Yes. And therefore, take you through as to how then these properties are going to uh, interact with your system. Yes. And then, so I find that his explanation that makes sense that even the learned now when we eat, we yes. then understand scientifically what are we eating and yes. how then the properties of each food, like you said that he wrote a book, yes. uh, th that Daniel first book. Yes. Uh, he mentioned a lot of, 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 of uh, what I would call vegetables or, or green medicines that perhaps uh, I know in one of your presentation you were at one time dealing with um yes, you know yes, yes, he, yes. he he named those kind of plants he tells you the properties and therefore on how then they become useful and important so yes. as a primary healthcare practitioner i found that uh, it, it is very it is not just a hearsay we yes. have a world expert physiologist who then explain chemical properties of the plants, of the food. Yeah. And then make it simpler to say, look, if you do this, your blood pressure controlled, you eat this, you are more likely. And in yeah. fact, your blood pressure will come so down. In fact, your sugar levels will be so controlled yeah. that uh, it will be amazing, unlike us who are going to give you pharmaceutical intervention in terms yeah. of either your injectables or, or your, 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 your metformins yeah. and, and, and. But yeah. I found that therefore it is much easier that if we then teach people uh, what the knowledge that the prof is having, yeah. then we give it to many people. We will not arrive at a stage whereby we must then uh, rely and depend on the injectables, on the tablets that people find them difficult to use, in fact, actually. You know, yes. that's why we end up with in, uh, yes. complications. All so right. I then said, I think therefore, uh, let us then um, uh, make this uh, knowledge scientifically proven, scientifically uh, tested, and also that is there in his book that we yes. can all of us use and then really uh, uh, deal with the burden yeah. of uh, non-communicable uh, chronic illnesses that are affecting majority of our people in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, let me try and get back to Prof again. I can see, yes. uh, Prof, can you unmute? Prof? Uh, Prof uh, Maseko? Yes, I'm um, mute me. Right, 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 right. Uh, can you hear me yes, now? Uh, yes, yes. We were talking about you in your presence. <laughs> yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> All right. Actually, okay. I'm listening. 
<laughs> I'm listening to every word. And Dr. Pierre is so accurate. <laughs> yes, yes, no, lovely, lovely. No, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll bring him back later. Uh, Dr. Pierre, all right, yes. uh, let me get back to Prof now. Um, because of the bandwidth on his side, we will just do the audio. Uh, okay. You know, uh, we'll, we will conduct the interview uh, via audio. Prof, all you right. were still telling us, uh, you, were told, you were telling us that um, you were lucky enough to get bursaries to go and do your undergraduate degree. Um, and uh, that, yes. room, that room that you got at Varsity was the first time you had a place to stay, you know, a stable place to stay because of yeah. the unfortunate situation uh, that you lost your dad, you know, in your first year of life and uh, that destabilized your family, you know, for a big part of that time. You know, yeah, yeah. So, 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 can you take us from that uh, point, uh, uh, Prof? Uh, to say, right, um, you you did very well at uh, high school. Uh, you got the bursary to go and do tertiary uh, studies. Um, and what was the that first degree that you did? Uh, the first degree I did was a BSc. Yes. Uh, because I was very interested in science. Uh, yes. I was a scientist at heart. Yes. And then uh, I moved that on to an honors degree. Yes. From a BSc, I went on to an honors degree. Sorry, I'm uh, then from there, I moved. Um, to the university of the, at Vets University, because I was very keen on medicine, yes. where I registered for Master of Science in Medicine. Yes. It was Prof? during that time, uh, yes. as I was a call, actually from the European Union. Yeah. Uh, that a lot of people are dying from diseases of lifestyle yeah. worldwide uh, who are specializing in their fields. And yeah. Because the solutions they had at the time that we know even now, like you'd find someone with a normal blood pressure, normal cholesterol, young, no family history of hypertension or stroke. And suddenly they die from one of these conditions. Yeah. Then that told us as scientists who are missing something. Yeah. So we gathered uh, in Belgium where I stayed for some months with my family, where we're trying to find solutions that what is it actually that we're missing as yeah. scientists. So yeah. this special focus area for me uh, was hypertension. Yes, you know. So everyone went back to their country to to work and find solutions, and we were sharing information. Yes, and here was I working at uh, Vets. The exciting part about Vets, as I was working there, is yes. that my mom once worked there as a cleaner, you know, yes. and now here am I working as an academic. So we used to joke about it that we've actually worked for the same boss in yeah. our lifetime. <laughs> yeah, so- we, At different <laughs> levels. At different levels. <laughs> but that show, just shows how women, with that money of a domestic worker, she pro produced the professor. Yes. Yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, um, yeah. So I came back because we were working with the community there doing checks checkups overseas, yes. uh, you know. So I came here and established something very similar yes. uh, with very high tech equipment uh, that was funded by the European uh, Union, uh, things you would not normally find in a normal hospital yeah. or surgery that can check the speed of blood flow, uh, yes. you know, that, that can check the, how blood is reflected back to the heart 
yeah. after the hard palm. So it's a lot of small detail that we were not looking at yeah. that we're now starting to check out to find out what's happening. Yeah. And as I was looking at hypertension, I realized that it's not as straightforward as it is. Mm. We have many different types of hypertension. Yeah. Uh, one that is very sneaky is isolated nocturnal hypertension. Yes, yes. Uh, this oh. one means people become only hypertensive at night. Yes. I'm sure you've heard about that. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. In fact, that's one I was going to be asking you about because um, you know, scanning through some of the articles that you have written, uh, you know, I mean, you've got about at least on Google, just on Google, about more than fifty articles, you know, research uh, publications uh, on various aspects, and yeah. this one about nocturnal hypertension, uh, and uh, you link yeah. it to salt. Was I want us to talk about? Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's no, isolated nocturnal hypertension, the other condition. So it means those people at night, they are hypertensive, but during the day, uh, they have normal blood pressure. So whenever that person goes to see a doctor, the doctor said, no, you are fine. There's yeah. nothing wrong with you. But as soon as they fall asleep, they become hypertensive. Yeah. So I needed to find out what's happening, what, what's, what's happening. So what I did... As I established my study in the township, you yeah. know, giving free checkup to people in the community and also helping them because I would go back and give them their results yeah. uh, and advise them. Yeah. So the way I used to, because we check urine, we check salt intake from the urine. Yeah. So I would take two different types of urine, daytime urine and nighttime urine. Yes. And I found that uh, people in our community have very high salt excretion during the night, mm. Mm. Which, is, which simply means it's a process we call pressure, pressure nitriuresis. What yeah. simply means that is that because your salt is very high, our body does not get rid of it during the day. But what yeah. happens at night in order to excrete that extra salt, your mm. blood pressure increases to increase mm. the filtration mm. so that you filter that salt, but it comes at the cost of increasing yes. your blood pressure. Mm. Now that's, that's what I discovered that the main problem with our community is salt intake. Yes. You know, uh, and it's not the same in all communities. Yes, I was uh, going It's mainly, I was going to ask you that question, Prof, firstly, to say, how prevalent is this situation? Uh, is there any difference in terms of the racial groups in South Africa? Is it something that is more common amongst people of African descent or, you know, I'm talking about indigenous Africans, you know, or is it something that you find across the four major race groups in South Africa? Uh, it's mostly common in people of African descent, yes. uh, because it's also found in African American. Yes. Uh, that thing is we're comparing results with my colleagues yes. overseas. Yes. And I've also done some studies here with white people of South yes. Africa. They don't yes. have that problem. They eat salt, they simply excrete it. Yes. It causes no problem yes. at night. Now there's a historical, uh, story to that yeah. uh, that uh, salt was actually very scarce in Africa yeah. uh, but I cannot say that's based on fact yeah. uh, so our ancestors developed mechanisms to retain salt yeah. when they get it yeah. now with westernization and the type of diet we eat now very rich in salt we still have genes that say hey here's salt keep it yeah. Before you lose it. Yeah. Now it's destroying us. <laughs> yes. You, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. Rob, you know um, I do some work for Radio 702 uh, every Saturday, you know, health yeah. promotion work. So the other time they asked me to talk about, you know, um, does salt 
you know, is salt, uh, high salt intake good or bad, you know? Uh, and so in, in my preparation yeah. for that, yeah. uh, I picked up that uh, high salt intake is not always a problem, you know, to all people. You know, uh, there are certain communities, I think yeah. in the Far East, uh, you know, in Asia, who have got very high salt intake, but it doesn't cause problems to them. However, here in Africa, yeah. like you are saying, you know, high salt intake does predispose. Uh, and you've got people who they get food served to them, even before they have tasted the food, they are already putting salt. Yes, you know? salt, exactly, yeah. That's the thing. And the issue of salt is very tricky because low salt is also not good. <laughs> That's yeah, the challenge. Yeah. So it's more like uh, the relationship between salt and mortality. It's more like a J-shaped curve, yeah. where if you are not taking enough salt, it's not good for you because you know how important salt is in our body. Yeah. I mean, your action potentials, uh, everything, yeah. you know, is dependent on salt. So we do need salt. The problem is we are taking more than what our body needs. Yes. And that becomes a serious problem, especially for us, uh, people of African uh, ancestry. Yes. That's yes. a serious problem. Another link that I found that I also published, yes. which is a South African problem, uh, it's weight, uh, yes. oh, being obese. overweight or obese. Yes. It's a problem in relation to salt. Because if you are overweight or obese, you usually, you usually have high levels of this hormone we call leptin. Yeah. And leptin is synthesized by fat cells. By making you increase your body weight, you have high uh, conserved salt. Yes. It reduces your salt excretion. So yes. Increased leptin leads to reduced salt excretion. So you retain most of your salt by virtue of being overweight. That's why yeah. you find that uh, diabetes and hypertension are actually linked. Because yeah. if you are overweight, uh, you become insulin resistant, you develop diabetes, but you also retain salt because of leptin and you become hypertensive. Yeah. So those are the two things uh, with us. So losing weight can actually help you with hypertension yeah. because you'll increase your salt excretion. Uh, yeah. Losing weight also reduces the number of, uh, uh, it reduces your, 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 your insulin resistance. Yeah. And you find that it solves the problem of uh, diabetes. Mm. So that's the main thing in our, community. Yes. Uh, eating more than what our bodies need. And I know it's cultural. Yeah. Uh, you know, we celebrate everything with food. You uh, know, my birthday, I even hid what I was eating because <laughs> no one was going to li listen to my health stories anymore. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a few uh, days ago. Yes, that's a few days ago. So I, if I did not take any pictures, you know, no yeah. pictures on Facebook <laughs> uh, because I was ashamed of what I was eating. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So but the be, problem is if it becomes a lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. All right. So then so that's a problem. The, so the issue of salt intake uh, and its relationship with hypertension and its relationship with diabetes, uh, you know, it's one of the things that you have actually zoomed in, you know, um, in some of, I'm looking now at some of the articles that you've published. There's a lot to do with, um, you know, the left ventricular hypertrophy, which is the enlargement of the left side of the heart. Uh, and uh, yeah. you were looking at that in relation to, uh, you know, uh, the, the um, genetic makeup and all of that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, now, I love the issue of genes. Yes. Uh, 
that there's nothing you can do about your genes. Yes. Uh, you know, you are born like that. Uh, like there are genes for hypertension that have been isolated and they are known. There are genes for uh, diabetes, you know, uh, genes for heart failure. Now, <laughs> the, the nice part is uh, genes do not act independent of environmental factors. Yes. So there are certain things that trigger and activate those genes. Yes. And mainly it's lifestyle habits, like overeating, uh, eating yes. junk food, lack of exercise. Believe yes. you me, you switch on all those genes yes. and they become active. Mm. So you are not just a victim of your genes. And we've also discovered that there's special diet that can switch off dangerous genes in your body. Yes. And they become inactive for the rest of your life. You may have a hypertension gene from your parents, but live yes. the rest of your life uh, without experiencing hypertension, mainly by eating healthy diet. Yes. You can avoid hypertension yes. uh, in your life. So that's the part about genes. So it means the main thing that counts, it's your lifestyle. Yes. Uh, you can modify uh, your genes. And the, the thing is, most of the genes that carry diseases are recessive. Mm. Uh, it, it means it's those genes that are not expressed unless you get it from both your mother and your father. Yes. So they are not easily activated. They are recessive. They are not dominant genes. Yes. There are very few conditions that uh, cause disease that are on dominant genes. So they yes. are mostly recessive. Uh, that's yes. why most of the issues can be avoided using diet. Yes. Now, if you are genetically predisposed because of family history, and then you are also eating a diet that is very high in salt. Mm. Now, when it comes to the heart, the, the salt affects your heart in two ways. Mm. We found that it's linked directly to increasing the stiffness of your blood vessels. Okay. With increased salt intake, there's a compound that your blood vessels uh, actually secrete, which is nitric oxide. Yes. Uh, that makes your blood vessels very compliant and soft. Yes. But with increased salt, you find that there's reduced nitric oxide uh, production by your blood vessels and they become stiff. Yes. So as they become stiff, it means the pressure increases your heart in those blood added. vessels. Exactly what we call the, 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 the afterload. Yes. So for heart, it has to pump against very high pressure. Mm. So it means your heart has to, very, heart act, uh, to pump very hard to ensure that you, because our, our heart works hard, it pumps five liters of blood per minute. Imagine yeah. that, five mm. liters per minute. That's the work of the heart. So imagine if you have to increase your blood pressure, the mm. heart has to maintain its output of five liters per minute, but it means your heart muscle is working very hard. Yeah. So like any muscle in the body, when it works hard, it increases in size. Yes. And the heart muscles become thicker because it has to generate more force now. Yes. But over time, as that continues with untreated hypertension, you get what we call slippage, where your heart muscle starts to stretch now yes. uh, and move apart. Mm. Now you enter now into the phase of heart failure, where mm. your heart is now increasing in size and the wall becomes thick yeah. because your heart muscle is stretched. Now, yeah. and then it loses its ability to pump yes. at that stage. And now you are in a stage that we call heart failure. Yes. You know, yes. and that's a very vicious and painful cycle. Yes. Because as the heart fails to pump, the kidneys sense that, that hey, you are not getting enough blood. Mm. Let's stop urine output. Mm. So you, you reduce, uh, producing urine, meaning you retain more water. Mm. 
mm. from the urine to increase the volume of blood. But yeah. that volume goes to a heart that is unable to pump. Yes. which makes it worse, it work, it work even more difficult. So it's yes. a cycle that goes until the heart fails completely and it stops. It's and you die. the point then that we also start to see, you know, the dilatation of the, of the left side of the heart, you know, towards things like more cardiomyopathy. Yes. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. So the, this issue of salt intake, uh, and our people, why are we then not hearing much uh, from a health promotion point of view? Uh, yes, I know if you go into the website of the National Department of Health, there is something where they talk about importance of reducing salt intake, but we don't hear enough uh, you know, about this. Uh, and what could be the reason behind that prop? Um, for me, what I've noticed, um, it's a business. Yeah. You see, you have to be on diuretics. Yeah. Uh, to decrease your salt intake. And that makes money yes. for big farm. Yes. So usually these um, interventions, which are non-pharmaceutical, they are usually, they are not promoted yeah. most of the time. And yes. as you know very well, each uh, pill that you take has its own side effect mm. uh, over time. Yes. Uh, but we can't deny the fact that it benefits you, but you yes. benefit much more mm. from lifestyle changes. It's also good for the, uh, for the industry, the food market. Yeah. You know, uh, salt is very good. It, it, it's, it's storage. It has these antibiotic effects. Yeah. where most of the tin stuff, they are rich in salt, not because of flavor, mm. but to kill any type of bacteria to make sure that it doesn't grow. So it yeah. is a food preservative. Yeah. So, so your tin food industry is benefiting a lot at mm. the expense of uh, killing our people. Yeah. I don't even want to go to fast foods, to your biltong, to your yeah. gurevors and all that stuff, yeah. you know. So salt is a preservative and it's benefiting uh, economically. So you yes. remove it completely, a lot of industries are going to suffer. Now, Prof. So we Prof. are being sacrificed here. Uh, for commercial reasons. <laughs> but now, Prof, yeah, when, we exactly. at, when we look at salt, you know, I mean, we live in a world now where most of the things we took for granted as we're growing up. Now, if I say water, you know, what water do you want? You are, you are my guest at home. Uh, long time ago, I would just go to the tap and get you water. Now there is tap water, there's bottled water, there's sparkling water, there's still water, there's flavored water. So when it comes to salts, uh, we also hear that there's different yes. types of salts. Some salts are better, you know, uh, at causing health challenges than others. Others, they talk about um you know the rough salt is better than whatever is there any scientific um you know uh, support to you know the different types of salts and their negative impact on the health of the people yeah you you forgot to add something cooked and uncooked salt there's also yes, that thing yes. yes that if you cook your salt it's much better than if you add it to your food yeah. Uh, scientifically, it's sodium chloride. I'm sure you know that, Doc. Yes. <laughs> salt is simply a combination of sodium and chloride. Yeah, really. And the main problem there is your sodium. Yes. Yeah. You know, so all of these things, it doesn't matter. They have the sodium that causes most of the problems in our body. Yes. Yeah. There is no better salt, you mm. know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Like we so, know our salt currently, they add iodine yes. uh, to it so that it's iodized. Well, yes. that's, that's solving thyroid problems, yes. but it doesn't make it a, a better salt. It's yes. just that it has iodine that benefits you, so, but it still has sodium. So your the energy. concept of the, uh, that certain type of salt is better than the other, uh, 
it may not necessarily have a scientific basis. Uh, it may just be a you know, part of marketing. Exactly. It's just like brown sugar and white sugar. Yeah. You know, uh, the same thing. <laughs> Chemically, you know, it's the same thing. Growing up, Prof, uh, we used to be told, don't eat too much sugar. You know, don't put too much sugar. You're going to have diabetes, you know. Uh, and then one went to medical school. And I don't remember being, you know, told exactly that if you eat too much sugar, you are going to have diabetes, you know? I thought, yeah. you know, so, so, so I think the whole concept of diabetes, you know, it needs to be, um, you know, presented differently for people to understand, you know, because the problem is the insulin, yeah. you know, uh, whether it's produced exactly. enough or it is produced, but maybe it's not very effective. Uh, that then leads yes. to the sugar rather than the sugar being yeah. the one that predisposes one. Or can you just talk to us about that? Prof? Prof? I agree with you because sugar may actually... Uh, we can't hear you, Prof. Uh, Prof? Uh, we lost sugar. You there for a moment. Oh, you can't hear me. Yes. We lost you for a moment. Yeah. Oh, let me now. There's something so we can't hear you. Can you, you, you are, hear me now? You are breaking, Prof. I'm not sure what the problem is. Oh. We were doing very well up until that point. Oh, you can't hear anything now. Now I can hear you well. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, something is just happening here with this load shedding. Yes, yes. And yes. strange oh, that not, I'm using not, my data now. It normally <laughs> affects the base stations because oh. they also need power backup. So once there's load shedding, then oh, you Oh, yeah. You see, so the quality yeah, of that makes the sense. telephone line or even, you know, uh, Wi-Fi goes down with load shedding. Oh, yeah. All right. So, what an unfortunate coincidence. Yeah, because now your line is really, really bad. Um, you know, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, let's just try and see if we can continue. Uh, if not, we will have to find a way to reschedule uh, okay. this interview. Okay, uh, I was still explaining the issue of sugar. Yes. Yes, uh, can diabetes. We can, yes. can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, I have simply changed devices. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm trying everything here. Yeah. Lovely, lovely, bro. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I was still explaining the issue of uh, sugar. Yes. That's the uh, can you say diabetes in Yes. Uh, your body usually likes uh, breaking down sugar because it's easy to break down for energy. So yeah. if you are eating a diet that has fat and sugar, sugar has a fat sparring effect. Yes. Your body will actually break down the sugar and you spare the fat. Yes. And we know what happens. It will accumulate. And that's why eating sugar leads to weight gain. Yes. Because you mostly use sugar and you spare the fat and it accumulates and you gain weight. Yes. Because in the presence of sugar, your body just ignores the fat. Yeah. And focuses on giving you energy through sugar. Yes. So that's how you gain weight. And eventually, if you gain weight, you gain more adipose tissue and you yes. become insulin resistant. Yes. To diabetes. Yes. Now, 
in a small percentage of people, it also happens that eating too much sugar, you know, the more sugar you eat, the more insulin you secrete to yes. make sure that, uh, you know, sugar is absorbed into your, out of your bloodstream into your cells. Yes. Now your body works in a strange way. So if you are constantly eating sugar, it means your insulin levels are constantly high. Yes. So what your body says, it says, ah, we have excess insulin. Mm. So your insulin receptors in the cells are reduced. Yes. So eventually you have less insulin receptors and over time you become insulin resistant mm. by mm. virtue of reduced number of insulin receptors. Yes. So sugar may affect you uh, in that way yes. in relation to diabetes. Yes. So yes. our parents may have been right <laughs> in a way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right, Prof. Now let's let's get back to the issue uh, which you the issue of um, diet. Yes. Uh, you know the kind of diet our grannies used to have is very very different. The type of things they used to eat and the type of food that we eat now, very yeah. very different. Uh, you know, other people will normally say, when you about to eat food ask yourself would my grandmother eat this yes or no if your grandmother would not eat this you must know that it is not healthy man that's just a rule of thumb now but obviously you are the scientist you know uh, our change of diet from what used to be eaten which was largely organic you know more yeah. than 100 years ago uh, to what we eat now which is what everybody uh, says um, you know, it, it's Western diet, uh, yeah. highly processed foods, uh, you know, high fat, high sugar, sugar, uh, high salt, and all of that. Um, so, um, scientifically, what have you guys picked up that are negatives uh, as a result of our migration from largely organic type of foodstuffs to more artificial, you know, or highly processed foods? And how does that affect our health? Yeah, um, the serious problem uh, with the high processed food. Uh, let me take the simplest thing uh, we used to eat as Africans. Uh, mabele, yes. uh, sorghum. Yes. Uh, maize meal actually came with the Portuguese, if you read the history. It's yeah. not an African thing. Uh, whether you go to Limpopo, Natal, whatever, it was Mabele, yeah. you know, and it was not processed, but it was just ground, yeah. you know, they would just grind it to prepare it as our staple food. Yeah. And that thing is as rich as brown rice yeah. in terms of its vitamin content and all of that, you know. And then came the Portuguese with the maize meal. With maize, there isn't much of a problem if you yeah. eat it, uh, you know, as it is, uh, because it's got all the fiber uh, that you need. But the way it's prepared, where it's made very fine uh, and made more edible, uh, yeah. it, it becomes problematic. Why the processed food usually have what we call a high glycemic index. Yes they have the ability to raise your blood sugar very sharply. Yes. You know, that's why people get surprised that when you eat pap, pap is not good for diabetes. Yes. You know, because uh, you eat pap with its high glycemic index, your blood uh, sugar shoots, and then you have a problem with diabetes. And there's also another problem. It increases your insulin levels. Having high insulin levels has also been linked to uh, aging very quickly. Yes. Insulin on its own is problematic. Yes. Uh, you know, that's why the other thing I've discovered through research is that people who fast are actually healthier than people who do not fast. 
that's Maybe. our that's our next topic, pre, uh, Prof. Okay. Uh, because that's linked to your to your book. Uh, I want us to talk about this concept of fasting, uh, and that uh, you know food was the first sin uh, of human <laughs> being. And, uh, so yes. fasting is a way of restoring uh, our spiritual and and physical health. We're gonna get there. Uh, okay. There's a question here uh, from uh, Michael Sikota, who's saying, "Is there?" Uh, any phytomedicine or medicines that can help to control the salt levels. Uh, he's one of our guests here, um, you know, Michael Sikota. Are there any phytomedicines that can be used to control salt levels? Uh, so far, honestly, nothing has come up uh, with scientific backing as far as that is concerned. But there's a quicker and much easier solution. Now, salt works with potassium yes. in your body. Yes. And you get your potassium levels from fruits yes. and vegetables. Those are very rich in potassium, such yes. that now we don't just measure your salt level. We measure uh, the ratio. Of, mm. so, of, of salt to potassium. So we call it your sodium to potassium ratio. Yes. And we find that people, those people who eat salt, if they also eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, they are able to counter the effects of salt mm. because potassium does the opposite yes. of salt. Mm. It actually reduces the amount of uh, fluids mm. uh, in your circulation because it's stored mostly inside your cells. Its concentration is much higher inside than outside the cell. So it has to a tendency to pull water from yeah. the blood into the cells. That's lowering your blood pressure. Yeah. It also acts directly on your blood vessels yeah. uh, to make them more compliant so that yeah. they become less stiff. Yeah. So my advice, which has been scientifically proven, yeah. Um, is that eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. In yes. that way, you are able to counter the negative effects of yes. salt. Yeah. Yes. Are there any specific, you know, uh, uh, fruits and veggies or just all of them there for that ability? Uh, well, some have higher potassium than the others, but I always try to avoid. Uh, that people eat a specific fruit. Yes. Uh, you know, like bananas are known to have a lot of potassium. Yes. But they also have a very high glycemic index. Yes. So yes. you are solving one problem, you are creating another. Yes. So rather, what's recommended is to have seven or more different types yes. of fruits and vegetables in your plate daily. Yes. Believe you me, your blood pressure will surprise you. Mm. Rather than eating seven bananas, yeah. uh, rather take a banana, an apple. Wow, that thing is amazing. Believe yeah. you me. That concept of an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Yeah. Uh, it's very true. Yes. Uh, an orange, your cabbage. Yes. That thing I know it's linked with pro poverty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the cabbage does wonders to your body. It's one of yeah. the best uh, vegetables you can get at a very reasonable yeah. uh, price. Yes. Yeah. You know, and then get your yellow ones like your carrots. Yes. Yeah. Or your butternut. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you find that the more variety you have in your plate, the safer you are. So don't have half of your plate being bar. Yes. And then you decorate with a little morojo on the side. That does not help you much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now you to you're talking about uh, something that is uh, almost a staple food uh, for most households uh, in South Africa. You know, a mountain of pap and some morojo uh, Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and meat. problem. You know, I, I have serious problems with pap, mainly yes. because people think it's our indigenous food. It's not. Yes. Our indigenous food is mabele. 
Hey. Which is very rich hey. in terms of vitamin content and everything. Yes. So don't tell me about pap, hey, it's our traditional thing. We took that thing from the Portuguese yes. and it's killing us yes. in so yes. many ways. Yes. So yes. keep away from pap, you can visit it. Yes. And I think Mabele is much cheaper than uh, white mealy meal. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so uh, if you swap the two, it makes a big difference to your health. Yes. Now, Prof, let's 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 now go to the part that led you writing a book. You were coming back from Spain some time ago, um, and uh, you, you you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yes. That made you. <laughs> Oh, that instructed you to write a book, uh, and this book was around, um, you know, fasting, uh, yeah. lessons from the book of Daniel, you know, yeah. which led you to write the book that you wrote. Just tell us a little bit about that book. Uh, in fact, my interest, because from the little I've read, you are bringing spirituality and science in one within that yeah. book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my research was mainly based in science. So I would be invited. I've really traveled the world, yes. uh, you know, because of the research uh, that I'm doing to share my findings with scientists yes. uh, all over the world, uh, yes. you know. Uh, so um, I never actually linked it to my spiritual part. You know, I would go to my science conference come back on Sunday and preach two yeah. separate worlds, yes. uh, you know, until I had, had that encounter on the plane <laughs> where I was now forced to integrate the wow. two parts of my life, my spirituality, oh. you know, and uh, my life as a scientist. Yes. So what happened, what actually happened when I came back after that conviction of writing a book, uh, I don't just write without any scientific proof. Yes. The first thing I did, I offered an, a, a master's project to a student yes. uh, based on the Daniel Fast. Yes. Uh, so that we invited people before going for a fast because they do it in January. Yes. And using the high-tech equipment that was generously donated by the European Union, we would check everything. Yes. They had the blood vessels, uh, urine content, I mean, sodium content in the urine, uh, everything. Just a general uh, checkup of the body, you know, your blood sugar content, cholesterol, everything. And then these people would, uh, would give them uh, just a questionnaire where they tell us what they've eaten. Uh, for the day. And uh, we said they should be honest, you know, if they've discontinued with the fast, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. You know, just tell us, just write. So we would do that for the entire 21 days. Yes. And then after 21 days, they would come again. Where would do the similar checkup mm. to see the changes? And we were shocked. Yes. What happens just within three weeks? You know, we would even check things like liver enzymes and, you know, we're leaving no stone unturned. Yes. You know, just to check everything, uh, kidney function and all of that. Everything came back much better. Mm. I know you are a doctor, it will be difficult for you to believe this, but there was one guy with a blood pressure of 165 uh, over 100. Yes. Uh, you know, and he came, I said, uh, have you been to a doctor? I said, no. I said, okay, you are a Christian, just get on this diet and let's see what happens. Now there are different uh, types of uh, even though most fruits and vegetables lower blood pressure. Yes. Uh, but beetroot, it has an activity of an ACE inhibitor. I you know, know, it's strange how some of these things are in the food that we eat. And, 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 and that's a favorite for duckies. I mean, there's no 
black uh, family function without beetroot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I said, uh, make sure that you take uh, beetroot uh, at least uh, around four times a week, mm. you know, and see what happens. If it doesn't drop, please, then you have to start medication. Yes. Uh, Doc, he came back with a blood pressure of 110 over 75. Unbelievable. In three weeks, Prof. In three weeks. I mm. couldn't believe the changes mm. in blood pressure. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, this, is, this was obviously, I mean, done, uh, uh, you know, within the scientific context. So this is not just some anecdotal thing, you know. No, I mean, no. This was part of your research. Mm. Exactly. And I had a control group. Yes. You know, people who are not fasting, because for your scientific study to, to, to actually be accepted, you need a control group. Yes. Uh, you know, and for a master's degree to actually be credited, it must be done under very strict scientific principles. Yes. Though I did not say to the scientists that I'm doing this, it's part of a religious practice. Yeah. For them, I was focusing on science. Yes. You know just to show the wisdom of God when he tells us to fast, yes. uh, what that actually does to us. So many changes uh, were observed, uh, you know, even left ventricular hypertrophy in some people, you could see and that it's actually starting to, 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 to go down. Yes. Uh, you know, well, cholesterol, almost 100% of the people. Mm. Uh, the cholesterol dropped, you know, uh, salt intake mm. dropped mm. and its effect mainly because of the increase in the vegetable and fruit uh, intake. Yes. So and that was the part. Now, Prof, just for me to get this thing right. So this is fasting between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Nothing to eat uh, and, and, and then eating after 6 p.m veggies only without meat uh, or just just a little yes. bit can you just clear that yeah uh, it's three you eat once a day yes at six yes uh, and you don't eat uh, after nine o'clock yes because as the uh, night progresses your metabolic rate drops mm. you know so I say eat from six to nine, you know, what you can take, but strictly fruits mm. and vegetables. Yes. You know, no junk food, uh, no fizzy drinks, no sweets, nothing. Yes. No meat as well. Yes. So just fruits and vegetables. Yes. And that's how they did it. And you drink as much water as you like. Yes. Uh, because water is very good, you know, for filtration and all that stuff. Yeah. And that's what the people would do. So the main reason they don't eat for a prolonged period, there are two processes that happen yeah. scientifically. Yeah. Uh, one is apoptosis and one is autophage. I'll explain this. Simple. Yes. Apoptosis. Apoptosis, we call it programmed cell death. Yes. Uh, it means your sick cells or your infected cells, they would rather commit suicide, kill themselves, than pass on infection to your normal cells. And that process is driven by low uh, uh, levels of sugar in your body. Yes. Uh, low levels of insulin, and you know that your glucagon increases. Yes. And it stimulates these processes. Mm. So it stimulates apoptosis. So it mm. means you become healthier. And that includes even uh, cancer cells, which are trying to form at that time. Yes. Please, I want uh, people to get me clearly. Fasting does not cure cancer, yes. but it can prevent it. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So you find that if they are trying to form during that process, because they, they are cells that require a lot of metabolism, 
in that low state of energy you are in, they are not able to thrive. Yes. Even those cells that start forming, they actually kill themselves yes. before they pass on mm. the sickness or the infection to other cells. Yes. That's one thing that benefits. Second one is autophagy. Yes. Uh, which is auto from automatic phagy, yeah. it's eating. Yeah. So when you are fasting, you start to develop these organelles we call autophagosomes. Yeah. It's little things in your body. These things, they are like scavengers. Yeah. They're looking for damaged cells in your body or damaged cell parts. And they eat them up, mm. reprocess them, and process that for new cell generation. So yeah. during fasting, your body actually regenerates itself. itself. Yeah, because without that, you find that these broken down uh, cells have a tendency of producing cancer cells. Yes. You know, yeah, those exposed organelles, those exposed mitochondria and stuff like that, uh, they tend not to follow the normal process of cell growth. Yeah. But they are pathological if they are not removed. Now yes. your autophagosomes during fasting, they eat up everything, all of those things. And since your body doesn't waste, you know, they reprocess and you regenerate yourself. And you know what most of the benefit is in your brain. Yeah. Because it happens even with your neuronal cells. Yeah. As you grow older, we know that there's a process of neural degeneration. Yes. Your brain becomes smaller, your reasoning capacity, you start forgetting. Mm. And we know that that happens to almost everyone. And it may get worse where it becomes dementia, yes. where a person can even be lost and not know where they are staying or whatever. Now, with fasting, it's been found that people who fast, actually, uh, it's very rare that they develop uh, dementia. Yeah. Why? Mainly because of uh, autophagy. Yes. As the neuronal cells start to degenerate, the autophagosomes are there, mm. taking up everything, and you get what we call neurogeneration. Yes. So you have this tendency to maintain your neuronal cells and the sharpness of your mind with when fasting. You fast. When but you fast, yeah. But how often can one do this, Prof? Because you talked about the Daniels one, which is in January. Uh, but mm -hmm. now, from all of what you are saying, uh, I can almost hear people saying, OK, maybe if I do this thing many times a year, I will benefit. So, uh, and I also worry that, uh, you know, even all the good things that can be done, sometimes overdone, they can create problems. Exactly. No, you are right there. The Daniel fast is fine for me in January for spiritual reasons and just to detox because we know what we do in December. <laughs> Not a secret. Yes. <laughs> we really do harm to our bodies. Yes. You know, just to detox both spiritually and physically, the Daniel fast is, is, is fine at the beginning of the year. Yes. Uh, but what I normally advise people from the scientific uh, background People who benefit from fasting are those who do it uh, twice or more a week. Yo. So if you fast two days a week, you uh, get all these benefits that I'm telling you about. Yes. You know, uh, the maximum you can do is what we, we call alternate fasting. Uh, yes. You know, there is something that is now uh, trending. Uh, called intermittent fasting. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, um, those of us who are in social media, you see a lot of people who are now into intermittent fasting. So uh, is there any scientific basis for that uh, intermittent fasting? A lot, a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was also surprised uh, that that helps uh, the intermittent fasting because it gives you these periods where actually uh, you are not eating. Mm. I think it's, it's, uh, it's effective when it's around eight hours. Yeah. You know, where you spread your meals. Because your body needs hunger. People don't understand that it's important to be hungry. Hunger is not a sickness. Mm. 
you know, hunger is a benefit to your body. I know most of us don't even know the feeling of being hungry because we're constantly eating <laughs> and you are missing something from there. Yeah. So intermittent fasting has also been found to have those benefits because you have those periods of hunger and your body within those periods is able to regenerate itself. Yes. They are naturally without any pharmaceutical intervention. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So, Prof, if somebody wants to buy that book, uh, you know, uh, of the Daniel's Fast, where can they get hold of that book? Uh, it's available online. Yes. Um, they can also WhatsApp me if you give them my detail. I think I still have a few copies. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, it was rejected by most bookshops. Why? And most South, most South African publishers. <laughs> That's very strange that we don't recognize the good that we have as South Africans. You know, when I wrote that book, I first presented it to most South African publishers. Yeah. Uh, none of them, you know, science and religion, that's crazy. I yeah. don't think they even went through uh, the proposed manuscript yeah. thoroughly. And then I said, let me try overseas. So I sent it to the UK, I sent it to America, and I sent it to Germany. Mm. To my surprise, all of these came with a positive response. Yeah. They were very interested. Uh, in publishing the book. So the, mainly, the main reason I chose uh, America was because of the exchange rate. Yeah. Uh, the dollar is much cheaper, so it will be more affordable rather than the euro in Germany or uh, the pound, you know, or the pound uh, in the UK. Mm. So though it's a South African book, it's actually important, important now because uh, no one was actually keen uh, here. So they promised to distribute it and send it to bookshops uh, that side, uh, you know. So I also do get some copies at uh, more than half, at less than half the price, yes. uh, you know. So I've been able to sell even myself. Some so one can get it from Amazon. Yes, Amazon, you can get the book. Yes. It's av av available, Amazon or Kittle or all of those. But let's, let's go back, Prof, to, to this thing. Why are people reluctant to, you know, to, I mean, these big shops, uh, are they thinking that uh, what you have inside there is controversial? No, besides the controversy, it's also our history, you know. Uh, if you are not a polar white uh, from America, uh, you know, or a T.D. Jakes, mm. and you come here with a surname Masego, who are you? Mm. That's that's the big question. We undermine uh, what we have here. That's the problem. That's why even most of my talks, you find that they are overseas. Yes. Uh, you know. Even Australians have invited me, yes. you know, to, to give talks on genetics and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm invited by more American scientific publishers to review their manuscripts. They will tell me that we recognize you as an authority in the field of hypertension. Yes. Before we publish this work, can you mm. please go through it? I get more of those than what I get from South Africa. Yes. So I think it's a problem that we have that we don't value ourselves that much. And we have so much to give yes. as South Africans, not just on the scientific field, everywhere. Yes. You know, we have this tendency when it's South African, it's inferior. So that's yes. the problem. All right, you know, but this issue of us not supporting our own uh, is actually quite prevalent on, you know, on many things. Sometimes some of our artists or musicians, we exactly. only have to recognize them once they have made, I mean, uh, 
this uh, Jerusalem song. Exactly, uh, yeah. Taking the world by storm. We did not really recognize it here at home. Uh, South yeah. African um, Music Association did not even, um, you know, choose it amongst uh, the nominees uh, for mm. the best song. Yet, um, it went out there and uh, caused, you know, the whole world to dance to it. Uh, exactly. And the guys are getting rave reviews everywhere else in the world. But mm. here at home, we only joined the bandwagon uh, once the world, you know, started dancing to it. So it, it happens, you know, in many areas. So I'm sure even with your book, uh, people will only, you know, uh, appreciate what is in there if the Americans and the Europeans and the Australians you know, uh, start making noise about it. Which exactly. Is yeah, it, that, that's a problem. You know, as you say, it's across the board. Who knew about Benny McCarthy before he went overseas? Yes. You know, uh, no one even cared. Yes, yes. You know, we yes. only realized that we have talent. <laughs> yes. That's yes. why he didn't even have a, a proper club yes. before he left yes. South Africa. But we are like that, you know. We just yeah. don't realize the richness that yeah. we have as South African. And other countries are so patriotic. I'm yeah. telling you because I've had an opportunity to live overseas. Yeah. You know, they are very protective of their own. They protect their own, you know. But with South African, we lack that national pride, that patriotism, that it's yeah. ours, it's Mzansi. You yeah. know, so we end up imitating everyone in the world to the point of losing our self-identity. Yes. So it's exactly the same with what we do scientifically. You can't believe what scientists are doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. So, Prof, um, as we, you know, go towards wrap up, you know, of our discussion. Now, on the issue of hypertension, I want us to go back to the, you know, high blood pressure. You mentioned the issue uh, of nocturnal hypertension you know the the, the pressure uh, that uh, it gets to, to rise uh, at night which is much yeah. more common amongst uh, people of uh, african ancestry than the other races uh, the yeah. concept of uh, ambulatory uh, blood pressure monitoring 24 hour monitoring versus yeah. what we do in our surgeries Mrs. X or Mr. X comes to my surgery, I take a blood pressure and then they go. Um, you know, I mean, literature talks more about the, you know, the better way is to measure, you know, over a 24 hour period, even looking at yeah. when you're sleeping and stuff like that. So can you just talk a little bit about that? But there's also a question here from Dr. Pia. Um, can Prof comment on the kind of food properties and the kind of chronic illnesses they help with? So uh, you can start with my question, and then I also answer, uh, you know, at a high level, uh, what uh, Dr. Tiha is, is actually talking about. Okay. Um, yes, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Actually, in uh, most Western countries, you never diagnose someone as hypertensive before you measure blood pressure over a 24-hour period. Because uh, blood pressure is not constant. You know, it changes throughout the day. Uh, you know, as I'm sitting here answering questions, you may find that it's higher than normal. Yes. Uh, but when I'm relaxing in my bed, it's lower. So that's why it's better to get, you know, an average of a 24 hour period. Yes. And if it's increased over that period, then you can diagnose a person as hypertensive. But the problem is uh, monitors are expensive. Yes. And they are not produced in South Africa. I yes. buy one for seventy-five thousand rands, yes. and I've lost I've lost quite a number of them because I I normally do checkups in the townships. Yes, you know, one person got arrested wearing that monitor, and police thought maybe it's a fancy cell phone, and they took it. I <laughs> Others drop it and it breaks. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge because yes. it's a very expensive piece, uh, piece of equipment. But what's been found to work is people who have their own monitors at home. Yes. 
just to advise them to take their blood pressure periodically mm. in 30 minute intervals. That's been found to actually compete with the more expensive ambulatory blood pressure monitor that we use. So before diagnosing a patient, at least let them get that thing. It's very cheap, you know, so those home monitors. Mm. Uh, and they just record on paper their yeah. blood pressure. And it will do during my time as a as a student, you know, we used to say uh, measure, you know, three times at three different, you know, times of the day. And if all three are, you know, are elevated, then you diagnose that somebody has got hypertension. But then, you know, recently one has been reading around the ambulatory, you know, a 24 hour monitoring as, you know, something that is much more accurate in diagnosing people. And then the question, therefore, is in the South African context, you know, how many of our people have been diagnosed, uh, you know, correctly or incorrectly through the standard way, you know, that we use to diagnose people? Yeah, quite a lot, actually. I've actually produced a paper uh, that shows how many people have been misdiagnosed. Uh, because of the way we're using, you know, the clinic blood pressure measurement, because there are two subtypes of hypertension that you may miss. There's one that we call masked hypertension. Yes. Uh, it's masked because it hides itself. When you measure that person's blood pressure in a clinic environment, it's normal. Yes. But when you check their blood pressure at home, it's high. So you'll never catch that blood pressure. Mm. in a doctor's office. That one is still very strange. We're trying, still trying to find mechanisms. Yes. And then there's a common one, which we call a white coat hypertension, yes. which is the opposite. They see a doctor, they become hypertensive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But they go home, they become normal. Yeah. And those people are usually misdiagnosed as hypertensive. Meanwhile, they are just stressed by seeing a doctor and knowing that their blood pressure is going to be measured. Mm. We call those white coat hypertensive. So those Maybe people those are... Who, when they were kids, uh, you know, they never really liked going to see doctors, you know, <laughs> and with a lot of fear of injection. So now even in adult <laughs> life, they see a white coat, they get stressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in the clinic environment, Ah, it shoots high, yes. but the very same person at home. So we're able to monitor that through ambulatory blood pressure, yes. because we can see that the time they spent with us in the clinic, yeah, blood pressure was very high. But yes. as soon as the person left our clinic, the blood pressure is normal throughout. Yes, yes. You know, and then there's this opposite one again. So that's why we need ambulatory blood pressure monitoring before you can actually diagnose a person yes. as hypertensive or not hypertensive. Yes, yes. Yeah. Can, 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 yeah. can you answer this question by uh, uh, my, uh, Dr. Pieha, um, you know, just at a high level, because obviously we don't have much time, just, you know, uh, foods that have got properties, uh, you know, that actually help uh, to make ourselves uh, healthier and keep chronic illnesses at bay. You had already mentioned the apples, for example. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, that that uh, old adage that uh, an apple a day uh, keeps a doctor away, actually there's a scientific basis to that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, there are so many. I'll just uh, pick the, the common ones, uh, you know. Uh, let's take, for instance, uh, broccoli, what we call broccoli. Yeah, the you know? broccoli. <laughs> I, I like, I even tell my students when I get into class that you are now going to listen to the way to accent. Yeah. I don't say physiology, I say physiology. Yes. So I like keeping my accent good, then I'll yes. say broccoli. <laughs> yes, you, you, you see, Prof, there's two types of people, uh, you know, uh, 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 well, there are those of us who went to the normal public schools, you know, yeah. uh, who are in the majority. And then there are those who have been privileged enough to go to the Model C or even private schools. So how mm. we pronounce things uh, is very different. I've got a friend whose name is, 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 
uh, according to the school I went to, he's Lincoln, you know? Hey. Uh, you know, his father named him Lincoln after Abraham Lincoln, you know, from, yeah. from America. But uh, those who went to private schools and Motel C schools, they say Lincoln, you know. <laughs> so, you know, uh, we must accept Broccoli to me, Broccoli. <laughs> yes, Prof. Uh, Prof. Okay, it seems like. Uh, We've lost Prof again. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, prof. Prof. Yes. Uh, right. I'm back with another device. Can you hear hey. me? Yeah, I can hear you, Prof. Yes. All right. We can hear you, Prof. Yeah, this thing. Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, I've changed to another device. I'm sorry. We're almost done. We're almost done, Prof. Uh, yeah, let's continue with the other device. But it's not this. It's it's not coming out very well. This one. Yeah. Uh, prof, this one. It's not good, Prof. Yeah. Okay, Prof. Yeah. So I'll say broccoli. We, we can't hear you properly, Prof. Uh, which has been found to make a genetic level. Uh, prof. Uh, prof. Genetically, with the, the cell. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, we seem to be experiencing uh, challenges here. Okay, um, that's that's sad because uh, we were almost uh, wrapping up uh, uh, our discussion with Prof. We were answering a question by Dr. Pierre uh, about you know the foodstuffs that have got uh, a benefit in terms of keeping chronic illnesses at bay. Uh, Prof was actually starting to talk to us about, you know, some of those foodstuffs, uh, and he was starting to talk about uh, broccoli. Prof? Yes, uh, my own. Oh. Well, now. You are still, you are, you are breaking, but uh, let's see, let's see how it goes, Prof. 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 Yes. Uh, I was no, you're, 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 one of those is broccoli. Your, your, your line is quite bad now, Prof. It's, yes. Your line is very bad now. Okay. Prof, uh, what happened to the device that you were using earlier? That was uh, a bit better because we were able to have a clear line. And let's say, uh, you know, uh, the data. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. But your, your line is actually not so good now. You break. Better. Apologies. Oh, I'll to see if I can get a better spot. Yeah, that's better now. That's better, bro. Hello. That's much better, bro. Bro. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, let's 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 try. Let's try, Prof. Uh, we can hear you. Okay, I was still talking about uh, broccoli. Yes. Um, 
uh, that it has an advantage. Uh, uh, research has shown that it actually it's actually able to prevent cancer at genetic level. Yes. Besides the other benefits, uh, it acts at genetic level where it shuts down. And so even if you inherited cancer from your parents, it's actually not expressed from cancer per se. Um, the, yeah, the other one, it's actually tumeric. All right, I think we are really pronounce it's tamary. Yes. Yes, yeah, I, think, yes uh, I was saying. Yes, Prof. Okay, I think we are really struggling now with, with Prof. Uh, apologies for that. Uh, he did not uh, uh, budget that there will be load shedding. So, you know, we are now trying to finish up the interview. Prof, can you hear me? We're trying to complete the interview, but uh, it's getting to be very difficult. Um, but we have covered a lot of ground. Prof? Prof? Okay, I think uh, yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, at yes. this point. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, can you just finish up the point around broccoli and turmeric? Yes, I was saying broccoli is very good for protection against cancer. Yeah, because it works at genetic level. Yes. Uh, uh, shutting down cancer cells. Uh, turmeric, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory. Yes. Uh, it has those properties to actually reduce inflammation. Yes. And with reduction inflammation, you find that it reduces cardiovascular diseases. So it protects your blood vessels and your heart. Yes. Uh, so it's very good. And people who eat the spice daily have been found to be much healthier and they are less prone to strokes and yes. heart attacks. Yes. You know, by just eating that uh, spice. Yes. Right. And uh, another typical example is your onion. So these are simple things you can buy from the shop. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, onion is very good in the sense that it's a blood thinner. Mm. Uh, that's one of its properties. Yeah. And by making your blood thin, there are less chances of uh, intravascular clot formation. Yeah. So you find that uh, if you eat onion regularly, you are actually protected from strokes and uh, heart attacks. Yeah. You know, yeah. So those are just some uh, uh, basic examples. And your sorghum, Mabele. Yes. Instead of pap, uh, very rich in the B complement vitamins, yes. which are cardioprotective. Yes. So you find that it protects you from uh, things like uh, strokes and heart attacks. Yes. And another important spice. Uh, you know, it's uh, cinnamon. Yes. For those who are diabetic. Yes. It lowers your blood sugar levels, uh, yes. cinnamon. It increases blood, uh, sugar absorption from the blood into your cells. Yeah. So wow. that, those are just a few examples. I can go on for weeks. Uh, <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> No, I think we're going to need to have another session where we're just looking at your know, natural foods and they are proven, you know, scientifically proven benefits. Uh, you know, we obviously yeah, can't cover yeah. everything in, in one day.
but I think it can be a topic it uh, on its own. You know, just on what are the things that yeah. are easily available in our grocery stores that if we include in our diets on a daily basis, we could actually yeah. be yeah. able yeah. to get a lot of, you know, benefit. Not uh, hearsay, scientifically proven benefits. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I would really love to do that because that's very helpful. Yes, yes, yes. Now, uh, the last one, Prof, my last question from me, um, and I'm not sure if you have an answer for it, though. Um, you are a pastor, a qualified pastor yes. for that matter. Uh, you went to theology <laughs> school and uh, you got uh, papers to show, um, you know. Now, uh, yeah, yeah. In the scientific world, uh, issues of spirituality are not areas that are, you know, easily embraced by fellow scientists. I don't yes. in general, but uh, in True. recent times, we have been seeing, uh, you know, some parts of the world starting to embrace certain spiritual practices. Uh, you know, age-old practices. Yeah, For example, yeah. acupuncture, yoga, mindfulness, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. and things like those, which are largely from the East. Um, and there's a lot of literature now, yes, and they yes. are becoming mainstream in the treatment of many, you know, uh, clinical conditions. But if you mm. look at them, like mindfulness, it comes from Buddhist practices, you know, Transcendental meditation, yeah. it, it, it comes from Ayurvedic medicine. So mm. I'm asking you then that now, obviously, you are spiritual from the Christian perspective. And we always say uh, from yes. a Christian perspective, prayer heals. How far are we in actually uh, doing a bit of research and proving that actually Prayer and meditation uh, actually do, uh, you know, reverse, uh, you know, ill health amongst human beings. Yeah, in the Christian perspective, meditation is quite different from the Eastern one. Yes. Uh, because it's not mindfulness where you empty your mind, but yes. with Christian meditation, you meditate, uh, on the word of God, yes, where you just saturate uh, yourself with the word of God. Yes. That's the actual meditation where you link up with God, you don't empty your mind. Yes. That has a very positive, empowering aspect in relation to Christianity. Yes. So it's very different from the Eastern one uh, but very helpful uh, in the sense that it aligns you with your maker. Yes. So you are not just emptying yourself, but you are aligning with yourself with God, your maker. Yes. And you find that you are tuned up for everything because you become so in touch, in touch with God through the Holy Spirit yeah. that even your life's agenda and your purpose in life becomes very clear. If you are a Christian who meditates, let me be specific, on the word of God. Yeah. Now that's Christian meditation that I know about. And yeah. that was also very helpful in terms of your health. Because faith without action, that's what the Bible yeah. says, is dead. You know, so prayer, having faith without any action, you will die while you are praying for you. <laughs> if you don't take active steps of your faith, <laughs> yes. we can pray until we are blue in our faces. If you are diabetic and you continue eating sugar, you are going to die. Prayer won't help you. Yes. You know, so in Christianity, faith must be accompanied by acts, you know, yes. which indicate your faith. I believe that God is going to heal me, but I need to be obedient. Because even the promises of scripture, they start that with if if you fully obey the word the, the word of you, the word of the Lord, then God will. 
there's always an attachment to a blessing. We rush to the blessing and we don't look at the attachment with obedience. So without obedience to the word of God, you will accomplish nothing as a Christian spiritually. So yeah. that all goes to meditating on the word of God. If you know the word of God, you meditate on it, then you are able to act in accordance to the word of God. Yes, yes, yes. That's the spiritual part of me. Yes, yes. So in your work, have you found situations where uh, your spiritual religious beliefs have come into serious conflict with your scientific uh, your knowledge and, and practices? Uh, not really. The two are actually in synergy more than what we think. I found that what I research actually confirms what I find in the Bible. There is no contradiction. Contradiction only occurs to people with little knowledge. <laughs> Christians who don't know science, they think of it as evil. And scientists yes. who do not know God, they think of Christianity, you know, as a ritual. Yes. So both groups are locked in yes. their ignorance, yes. not knowing that science is actually the science of God. Yes. You know, so <laughs> to me, science reveals the wisdom of God. Yes, yes. So yes. there's no conflict whatsoever. Yes. All right, Prof. I think uh, yeah. at this point, uh, let me thank you for availing yourself for almost two hours, uh, just chatting, you know, uh, for me, it's part of your birthday celebrations. You have empowered us with knowledge. Yes. Uh, it's not the last time we are connecting with you, Prof. Uh, we will, you know, this big elephant of non-pharmaceutical approaches to making people healthy, mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to need to eat it in small bits and pieces, you know, so that uh, yeah, our yeah. people are empowered. So, but uh, you gave us a good overview of the work that you are doing. Uh, you know, it's meant to celebrate you. Uh, we have a thing of celebrating people once they have been recalled. Uh, but, uh, you know, we must recognize and celebrate people whilst they are here with us. Uh, and be able to tell them that uh, you know they are doing great work uh, and they are adding value to humanity and that's what we've been trying to do today uh, and as usual like all teachers you have been you know doing your best to try and uh, educate us about things that we don't know much about so i want to thank you prof uh, for giving us your time i also want to thank you uh, to thank uh, dr uh, Piha because uh, he is the one who connected us, but uh, going forward, mm -hmm. I definitely will be calling on you whenever we have uh, issues uh, around the NCDs, the whole space of cancers. Uh, you know, I want yeah. us to have a day where we are just talking cancers and uh, how can mm -hmm. we help people to actually reduce, because we see more and more people dying from cancer of the lung, cancer of the breast, yeah. prostate cancer, leukemias, and all of that. And mm -hmm. uh, it is important to say, what can be done you know, at a preventative level? You've already spoken about mm. some foodstuffs that can switch off the genes you know, that predispose certain people to cancers. So that will be a, a, a conversation on its own. So, but uh, for today, yeah. Uh, I just want to thank you, Prof, for giving us your time. Uh, you know, uh, we really, really appreciate it. And I hope uh, the people who joined us here also enjoyed uh, the discussion. Thank you very much, Doc, for the in, uh, invite. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I apologize for the load shedding, even no. though I'm not responsible for it. As, as, as is responsible. <laughs> Yeah, I hope our next meeting will go much uh, smoother. And just to tell you, I'm working on another book, uh, which we can share, which is yes. Forever Young. Uh, I'm going deeper into these topics. Yes, uh, you, you see know, now that, how you can maintain you. You see now, Paul, now, now you are talking. You. Now you are talking, <laughs> Prof. Uh, you know, I'm in my early 50s, and, uh, you know, um, I, I definitely do want to stay young. 
uh, because my partner is yeah. about five years my junior. So uh, I, I oh. need to <laughs> I need to continue to live younger for longer, uh, Prof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, but, but thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I appreciate your, your time. And thank you to everybody else uh, who joined us. Uh, you know, I, I hope you picked up one or two things that will add value in your own uh, life. Um, at this point, uh, I need to then say goodbye uh, to everybody. Uh, we will be uploading this recording um, on social media platforms that can then be shared you know, for other people who are not able uh, to join us here today. So I want to thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Pieha wants to say something before we end uh, the show. Dr. Pieha, can you unmute? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Yes. No, I also want to thank you, Dr. Pundile, that uh, once I came in contact with you, uh, which was through the social media, at first we were debating, but uh, I softened up to you after listening to several of your guests. I must acknowledge that uh, indeed you bring us uh, outstanding individuals from different uh, sectors of life who are doing well. Uh, and I must acknowledge that thank you very much we have learned. And thank you that without, uh, indeed, I mean, it was very prompt. Yeah. Uh, it just occurred to me and I just sent a line and uh, you are a people's person because you didn't ask many questions. You gave it time that you will check and then say, okay, and you like the topic and then you went for it. I appreciate that uh, because we don't know each other personally, but um, upon the making suggestion, you looked at it and you came back to me promptly and then you said, Doc, uh, keep us in contact so that we'll talk to the prof. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that you did. And today we have had this session. May God richly bless you uh, that your channel will grow from strength to strength. And as for prof, he is a real gem as well. Very humble human being, uh, but always approachable. And uh, he must get out of the way too. <laughs> 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 so that he can connect better <laughs> yes <laughs> but anyway thank you prof maseko uh, god bless you and your family what you know we really need to empty you uh, and so that the whole world especially in south africa we may know as much so we are waiting for that book so that i like dr fundile i also want to remain young my partner is young, so I, I too, uh, don't. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to reading how to remain young. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you.